Hi, everyone. Um, this is our parent information training um, here at HeartSpring. My name is Tristan. I'm the care program coordinator. Um, and we have Holly um, here to talk with us a little bit about AAC. So take it away, Holly. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, let me share my screen here. So we did that go? Yes, it's black right now. Oh, but it says Holly started sharing. There it is. There we go. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to be talking um, with you guys a little bit about, um, let me get this actually on. There we go. Um, about um, augmentative and alternative communication because October is augmentative and alternative communication month, which is very exciting. Um, it's a passion of mine. Um, so just a little bit about who I am. I'm one of the speech and language pathologists um, on the residential side at HeartSpring. Um, not a lot of people know, but we do have a residential side at HeartSpring um, along with the outpatient side as well. Um, I've been um, at HeartSpring for a little over 11 years and really been focusing on augmentative and alternative communication. Um, I got a PhD in that area, um, finished that about three years ago. I've published some work in the area of AAC, taught a course. Um, we started a Kansas AAC Summit um, presentation and workshop for um, local community members. Um, so it's just, it's an area that I feel very passionate about and giving a voice to the voiceless. Um, so I'll get in and kind of tell you a little bit about what we're going to be discussing um, today. So um, some simple learning objectives, um, defining the basic tenets of AAC, different forms, how to be an efficient and effective communication partner, and then also how to implement and incorporate AAC into your everyday life. So this is kind of like a, a crash course in AAC, um, kind of an overview. Um, so first, we're just going to talk kind of about the basics of AAC. This is where I like to start because I think it helps people get um, a better idea of um, what it is and um, the terminology that goes along with it, which can help you have better discussions about it if that's something that you need or um, your child or a client of yours might need. Um, so this is a really kind of a, a thing for me is knowing the right verbiage um, because it helps you communicate and have better conversations with school, facility, different partners that you might be working with um, so that you're all kind of using the same, the same lingo, if you will. Um, so first off, what is assistive technology? And I like to consider this um, a broad umbrella. So assistive technology is any tools or strategies that help you get something done um, every day. Um, so it can be anything that makes something easier for a person to do. So that could be accessing things, reading, communicating, writing, a lot, lot more. Um, so I'm sure people have seen, you know, the remotes that have the big um, buttons on it, which are easier to see if you um, have vision problems. Problems, that could be considered assistive technology. Um, in the school, we have some kids who use um, a touch screen um, on the computer because, you know, utilizing a mouse is not um, something that they can do easily. So that would be assistive technology. And under that big umbrella of what assistive technology is, AAC is part of that. So AAC systems are ways to communicate. If you can't communicate via traditional means is part of assistive technology. Um, and I like to start with this because I hear people use these terms interchangeably a lot and um, they can mean really, really different things. So I think it's important to know the difference. Um, so the American Speech and Hearing Association states that AAC is just attempts to study when necessary, compensate temporary or permanent impairments um, of people who can't speak. Um, so it can be aided or unaided. So I'm sure a lot of people know about sign language, which would be an unaided form of AAC because you don't need anything extra um, to go along with it. Um, an aided AAC would be something like pictures or um, a communication system, an iPad, things like that, because you have to have something else um, with the person. Um, and there's tons and tons of different AAC in this. Um, when I started in this field 11 years ago, there was a lot less, <laughs> and now there's lots. Um, so there's no tech, low tech, mid tech, high tech, and we'll get in to some of those here soon. Um, and it's a multimodal approach. So um, if you think about the ways that you communicate, you communicate not only with your voice, but you also communicate by pointing and facial expressions and gestures. And AAC is just that, it's a multimodal approach. 
um, that's helping to um, give a voice to people who can't speak. So um, next we're gonna go into just what are some of the types of different augmentative and alternative communication. So we're gonna look at specifically no-tech, low-tech and high-tech. Um, I like to use this terminology, no-tech, because, um, and sometimes you'll see people uh, say communication books and things like that are considered low-tech. Um, I say no-tech because it's just a piece of paper. Um, when I've given presentations to people and they say, where do I start with AAC? And I say, grab a piece of paper, if you've got a printer, great. If you don't, you can even draw pictures, um, but start somewhere and start doing something um, so that you can help people have a way to communicate. So these are some examples of object communication. Um, so we like to say that um, when it comes to understanding that you kind of go along a continuum. Um, so objects are pretty, uh, probably the easiest to understand. And then you're gonna work your way up to pictures, um, of objects and then um, hopefully to like a symbol set, which I'm sure some of you have heard of board maker, which I'll show you some pictures um, of that. So um, object communication um, is the actual object if you can get it, um, or it can be a part of the object. So it's just a much clearer representation for a beginning communicator to know um, that drink is always associated with this cup. Um, and so when you're using object communication, the client or student uh, or child would hand you the object and then you would immediately then give them uh, a drink. Um, and some uh, vocabulary is harder to represent than others. You can see on there, help is a glove. Um, even with symbol sets, um, like on board maker, it's hard to find um, representative um, pictures. And so some of these things um, are just going to be uh, something that you have to teach, um, an incidental teaching. So every time that student needs help, you give them the glove and they start to learn that this means help, um, which we'll talk a little bit about when we talk about how to be a, um, an efficient and effective communication partner. Another um, type, like I was saying, you see some board maker pictures here are communication books. Um, so these are just simply pictures where the student can point to the picture and then the communication partner um, would verbalize for them what they point at. So if I was to point at the picture of, um, let's see, yes, then um, my communication partner would verbalize that for me. So they would say yes. Um, these can look all different kinds of ways. So um, one thing that I do as an SLP is first thing, assess how many pictures a student can scan um, to determine how many pictures that we're gonna put on the page. Um, and that just helps because if a student or a client can't scan as many pictures and you're putting too many on there, it's gonna be too overwhelming for the client. Um, we do talk a lot about um, what's called the zone of proximal development, um, which is basically just being able to stair step up or down. So if I assess and I see the student can handle eight pictures on a page, maybe I'll start at some point to put 10 pictures on the page and see if they can do that. Um, and if they can't, then I'll go back down to eight. Or if I decided on eight and they're struggling, maybe I need to go down to six. So just keeping in mind, how can I make it um, a little bit more effective, but also if they're struggling, how can I make it um, a little bit easier? Um, the other thing that we really, really stress um, at the school is that we want to be able to find a way to attach the system to the student. Um, so a lot of times we put them on belts. Um, the reason for that is people who are nonverbal learn to communicate in the most effective and efficient way. And for the population that I serve, a lot of times that's through behaviors. Um, so I know that if I um, kick you that you're going to give me something to eat, something to drink, you're going to let me get out of this and you're going to help me. So I've learned that all four of those things are communicated through um, kicking. Um, so we want to make sure that we provide a better way for our students to communicate. And if a communication system is always put up in the cubby or in a backpack, it's going to be much more effective for me to kick you to get my needs met than it would be if I have my system um, right by me so that I can access it immediately and that staff can also model that for me. Um, if they think that I'm hungry, you know, instead of kicking, showing me how to request for food. Um, and I think that's, 
that's a huge thing because when I um, have done observations and things like that in different places, communication books and systems, whatever it is, um, a lot of times aren't necessarily always with the kid and they're um, other places. And so I think that's something to really, really hit on is that you've got to make sure that the communication system is with the student um, or client or child all the time for it to be an effective way to communicate. Um, so next, um, I'm sure lots of people have heard of PECS, which stands for the Picture Exchange Communication System. Um, so those are the pictures over on the right, those pull-off pictures. And um, that yellow strip is what's called a sentence strip. And so with PECS, what you do is the client or child pulls off the picture, puts it on the sentence strip and hands it to their communication partner. And then um, the communication partner says the words as the student points on the sentence strip. Um, the other system here that's um, pretty common is called a pod. It's pragmatically organized dynamic display. Um, and it's what we would call a point um, and carry system because the child points to the pictures instead of pulling off the pictures. Um, we really do kind of a combination of all of these. Um, we've had students um, eat the sentence strip. So that's uh, something that we wouldn't want to do or eat the pictures. Um, so we tend to kind of do a mixture of all of these. And so we, um, because both of these are copyrighted systems, tend to say a point book or a pull off picture book um, since we don't follow exactly what they do. And I made a note here, verbiage here is so important. Um, I will hear people sometimes ask me like, can I get a PEX picture for their schedule? And I'm like, that's, that's, not, <laughs> that's not what it is. It's just simply a picture with Velcro. Um, so we just wanna make sure that we're using the right terminology um, and uh, giving due credit to PEX and POD if we're not using that exact system, just calling them simply what they are, a point system or a pull off picture system. Um, another type of communication of no tech um, would be eye gaze boards. Um, and so you can see here different people using eye gaze. Um, one tip or trick that I will say that I learned the hard way is to make sure that you know what the picture is on the back. So if you're looking at it um, from the back that you know the picture that the um, client or child you're working with is actually looking towards. Um, and these are, uh, the two on the right are kind of fancy. They've got a plexiglass board. Um, it's super easy to make these. If you've got a laminator, you can just put the pictures in a, a, a sheet of laminated, a sheet of laminate and uh, put it through the laminate. And so the, um, the inside of it will be clear. Um, and so it would just be the pictures. Um, so this is something that uh, is pretty easily, uh, easy to replicate. Um, if you needed to for a client to start doing something. Um, and a lot of times you would use eye gaze boards if a client were to have issues um, with direct selection, which would be pointing to pictures, things like that, um, and they can use their eyes instead. Uh, this is a good option for that if you can't, um, if you've got the motor impairments. So um, again, here's some other options of just simple communication or choice boards. Um, when we talk about AAC, we um, talk about it a lot in terms of working with children, um, but AAC is something that's really important in a hospital setting or a long-term care setting if somebody um, has lost the ability to speak because of a trach or something like that. Um, this is really helpful. So you can use, you see down there, the um, communication board for healthcare. Um, and these are really easy just to find online. Um, and then you can see there, we've got like a letter board. So if you've got somebody who knows how to spell a letter board um, might be more helpful because they can create novel phrases and not just rely on the ones that um, you've put in their communication system. Um, you can also see in the top left, there's um, a board that would be something uh, used at mealtime. And then there's back time communication. Um, so I like to say for choice boards, or when you're creating an AAC system in general, especially if it's a picture book, that that's precious real estate with what's in the actual book, especially if the student has trouble turning pages, you might only have three pages in that book. And so where I start with vocabulary selection is really making sure that um, those um, 
interfering behaviors like a kick or a hit or something like that, finding out what the function of that communication is and putting that in the communication book. Um, but maybe something um, like shampoo isn't so necessary if the student can only have 15 pictures in the book. So that's when I would provide a choice board for them. Um, so it's got that extra kind of fringe vocabulary so that they can still learn about it, but it doesn't necessarily need to be in their book that's traveling with them all of the time. And um, we also do for all of our students that have high tech communication systems, we also provide them with what are called backup books. Um, and so what this is, is simply screenshots of the main pages of their book. And um, we laminate them and put them on a key ring and put them on a belt. So this is important because there's obviously places where um, you don't want a student to take a high tech system. Um, when our students go to the water park, I say, please don't take that iPad with them because we don't want it to get wet and ruined. So that's when they would use these backup books instead. And like I said, we just use those main pages um, because if we did every single possible page, um, the books would be uh, really, really big. <laughs> and students, for the most part, aren't as efficient with their backup books as they are with their higher tech systems because it is more work because you do have to flip through the pages. Um, but we want to ensure that consistency between the systems, um, which is why we do that. So that same motor pattern that a student um, learned with their system, um, they'll have that with the book so they know where to go. Okay, so now those were some no tech options. So there was no technology involved. Um, now here are some low tech options. Um, and I say low tech because these, um, you do need to record your voice onto them. They don't have, they're not what's called speech generating devices in terms of um, they don't have voice pre-programmed in. Um, so there's lots of them. There's Big Mac switches, there's Go Talks. Um, so this would be something for somebody who needs that kind of output, um, the voice output. Um, these aren't always the most durable um, equipment, so that's something to consider too, is the hardware of a system. Um, what we love about communication books is they're easy to replicate. So if I've got a student that's constantly tearing it, I can just simply reprint it and re-laminate it. Um, but we have students who really like um, some of these low tech options too. Um, the big Mac switches can also be used for more assistive technology. Um, so we have a student who likes to listen to country music and um, that's a leisure activity for her. And so we've programmed a Mac switch um, with Carrie Underwood on it. And so she can independently hit that when she wants to listen to music. So there's lots and lots of different options you can use um, these types of things for that aren't necessarily um, communication, only communication. Then we've got high tech systems. Um, I think over the years, people just assume high tech systems are always iPads with a communication app. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. There's lots of different systems. Um, iPads are just a lot of times easier to purchase um, than these systems because these can um, run up to, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. They're very expensive. Um, but if you see the young woman on the top left, she is using an eye gaze system. Um, there's also different types there below, um, but these are what are called dedicated devices. So um, you do have to a lot of times go through insurance to get one of these, um, but the companies are great also at helping you kind of decide how to do that and how that would look. And then the one that most people are probably the most familiar with are communication apps. Um, so these can be on iDevices or Android devices. There's lots and lots of them. Um, we typically um, use just a couple when we're doing assessments um, that we've found to be helpful. Um, but as we'll talk about here, um, AAC should it needs to be individualized. And so trying lots of different things to see what works best for a student is always always going to be your best bet. Um, you can also see the one in the top right has a carrying case. Um, that's something we think about a lot because our students like to throw things. Um, so when you're looking at systems, knowing not only what does the software look like and how is that um, working for my client, but also what is the durability like? Um, because that's something that needs to be taken into account also. Okay, so now that you've seen kind of all of these different types of AAC, so who are the people that can benefit the most from this? 
Um, so like I said, uh, AAC stands for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. So that's kind of twofold. Um, so what that means is that AAC can be used to augment communication or be an alternative to verbal communication. So augmenting might be, um, I lost my voice, so I'm going to write everything down right now, or I'm going to use a communication system. Um, alternative might be that I'm a nonverbal child and I need a complete alternative to verbal communication. Um, so there's really a lot of people who can benefit from AAC. And I always like to say we, I mean, we use it all of the time. Anytime you write something down, anytime you use a picture to communicate, um, all of those things are augmentative and alternative communication. So um, in terms of who can benefit, really everyone. There um, are some common myths that surround AAC, um, such as cognitive or age requirements. Um, and there's a lot of research to show that those aren't true. Um, if you think about babies, we teach babies, um, baby sign a lot, um, and they're pretty young when we start teaching them that. So, um, if you've got somebody who's not communicating, um, or meeting those milestones, I would highly suggest starting to consider AAC, um, since there aren't any age requirements or cognitive requirements, um, and another concern that I've heard from a lot of parents over the years is, you know, if I provide them this, they won't actually start verbally speaking. And again, there's a lot of research to show that that's not true, that um, a lot of times it can increase um, verbal communication. And I would say anecdotally, I've seen that with a lot of my kids. Um, and my my assumption is that they're getting that um, that verbal feedback. So every time I hit the button of um, lion, it says lion. So I'm seeing the picture, I'm hearing it. Um, and so I think that just kind of helps also develop uh, some of that verbal communication. So who can benefit? Lots of people. I would say if you've got an inkling that, you know, I've got a child who's not speaking, start looking into AAC. Which kind of brings us to how do I do that? <laughs> um, so I would say get in touch with um, a speech and language pathologist um, as soon as possible. Um, there's research to show that if you can get um, early intervention in with kids, they're going to make a lot more progress. Um, Unfortunately, on the school side, a lot of times the kids don't come to us till they're 14 or 15 or 16, and it can be a lot harder to teach communication systems um, when you're at that point versus if I could have started working with a kid even as young as six months or a year old um, to start using communication systems. Um, so as early as possible, if you have a question, I would get in touch with an SLP um, and reach out. Um, and then I would say ask questions. Um, one of the downfalls that I see happen most often is SLPs aren't as familiar with AAC, so they don't recommend it. Um, or that um, maybe I went to a conference on this one um, AAC system, and so I'm using it with all of my kids. Um, I can tell you out of the 70 plus kids that we serve on the residential side that no child has the exact same system. Um, some of our students have the same types of books, but what's in them is completely different. Um, some of our students have the same communication apps, but again, what's in them is completely different. Um, so ask questions and know that one size doesn't fit all and that it should be individualized. Um, I had a parent from the community reach out to me once and say that her daughter was nonverbal and she was trying to figure out how to get an AAC system for her. And she said the district had told her, um, you know, we're gonna get one, but it'll be for all of the kids to use. And I said, you know, that's that doesn't really make sense because we all communicate in our own unique ways. And so the students that um, we're serving should have that. Um, when you get to school age, if you've got an IEP, you know, the I stands for individualized. And so communication is part of that. And um, an AAC system shouldn't be just used with speech. It should be used with everybody um, and kind of weaved into every portion of a child's academic um, or pre-academic life. Um, like I showed you, there's so many options to consider. 
Um, so know what's out there. Um, the Facebook groups that you can join are some of my favorite ways to get information um, or ask questions. Um, so there's lots of those that you can um, join to get some ideas too of how, is, um, how have other people gotten this for their type of child. Um, and know that an AAC system can change as a child um, gets older. Um, and it probably should. As you're learning more, it should change and develop with you. And so it's okay to say, I think, you know, maybe if you've got an AAC system for your child now, hey, I've got this, but it's not working. Um, or I think it needs to be added to or changed a little bit to add more robust communication. And that's okay. Um, and also ask for an AAC evaluation to determine best fit. Um, this is something, this was actually what my um, doctoral research was on was the AAC evaluation process. But if you do a, um, a, an accurate AAC evaluation, most of the time you're gonna come out with the best fit for a system versus um, just, oh, this is the only one we have. Um, so I would ask for an AAC evaluation if you can, and the data that supports um, the fit of uh, the AAC system that's been provided. Um, and then finally, just reach out for help. Um, just you just being here, um, <laughs> listening to this presentation today, um, puts you in a great spot to at least know. Um, when I taught the AAC course at WSU, I told all of my students every year that you're never going to know at the end of this semester everything about AAC, but I want you to know enough to start asking questions. Um, this isn't working. Why is this child three with no verbal speech and has no way to communicate? Um, starting to ask questions is the biggest step when it comes to AAC, and then knowing that you can reach out for assistance. Um, my information will be on the end of this, so um, I have people reach out a lot, and I, I love helping um, since this is such a passion of mine. Um, and like I said, those Facebook groups are wonderful ways to get information as well. Okay, so now that you know um, a little bit more about what types of AAC systems there are, how to get one. Um, so I always say after you get one, that's just the beginning of the journey. <laughs> um, so now you need um, to teach it. Um, a lot of times people have this false narrative that if I've got the AAC system, my student or child will just learn how to use it. And that's not true <laughs> without help. Um, I liken it again to um, how you and I learned to communicate as we were growing up. Um, we learned because people taught us and helped us. Um, and so the same is true with an AAC system. You have to teach it. Um, it's not just going to be something that the student magically starts using all of the sudden. Um, I like to call that the dateline effect because every once in a while you'll see a dateline episode or something like that where um, you know, a student was given an AAC system and magically they're all creating poems now. Um, I can tell you that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, the point of the evaluation is to figure out what the student picks up on quickest and can navigate easiest. And then after that comes the teaching part. So it's really, really important that intervention piece too. So we're gonna talk a little bit about, more about how to do that. Um, so, I really like um, this terminology. And so it's communication partners and communication assistants. Um, so a communication assistant would be um, like a student's staff, or it could be a parent, it could be the SLP. Um, and their job is to help that student have, um, or child have successful interactions via prompting, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, they're familiar to the students and ideally their role is going to decrease over time. So that would be because as the students becoming more independent, they don't need the assistant as much. Um, and I can tell you one of the hardest, hardest things is um, for our staff and myself included is to learn when to take a step back. Um, there's a term called learned helplessness um, that is, I think, afflicts a lot of the population that at least I work with because, you know, we're taught from a young age that if you see somebody struggling, you help them. You don't make them communicate before you help them. And so that's just kind of innately in us, and especially if you're in a helping professions role that you want to help. But what can happen is the student becomes dependent on you and knows that you're just going to do it all for them. So why would I ever do it myself? Um, so being aware of that as the assistant, that I need to only prompt when necessary, 
um, and things like that, which we'll get into a little bit more. Um, so then a communication partner um, is just anybody else that's in the interactions. Um, they're not there to help um, with the communication system. Their role doesn't change and we all have them. So it could easily be um, the greeter at Walmart or um, the uh, barista at Starbucks when you're ordering or your waiter or waitress. Um, one of my favorite things uh, when we used to take the kids out to eat pre-COVID, um, a waiter or waitress would ask me, well, what would he like? And I said, I don't know. You need to ask him. <laughs> um, so in that scenario, I'm acting as the student's assistant because I'm helping them have successful interactions. And then the waiter um, or waitress would be the partner um, in that scenario. Um, I also like to consider the assistant, the communication, um, for the student's or child's advocate. Um, so they're assisting, but they're also advocating, like in that scenario, I'm advocating that um, my child can speak for himself. I don't have to do it for him. Um, and so I'm helping him be successful. So um, just some kind of tips to think about um, when you're a partner or an assistant, and obviously you're in a, a situation, you can be both at any time. It's, I think, just important to know kind of that when to back up example or, or uh, when to back off example um, so that you know um, that the student's being independent as possible. Um, so if you've got a child um, that just got an AAC system, it can be very daunting <laughs> um, to know what's all in it, how do I use it with them? And my best piece of advice is just take some time to go through and see what's in the device. Um, you know, when your child is taking a nap or maybe sleeping at night, grab it from them, look through it, see what's there and start thinking of ways to communicate with them using it. Um, a lot of the population I'm working with, um, we say, you know, what do you typically develop or what do you typically talk with a child about? That's what you should be doing um, when it comes to um, somebody using AAC. And we're going to speak specifically here in a minute about book reading and also at mealtime, because those are two of my favorite, um, favorite times to get a lot of communication opportunities. Um, Allowing wait time. Um, a lot of people who use AAC might need some additional wait time. And I'll show you kind of a cool example on the next slide of how horrible that can be sometimes when you're the person who's having to wait um, because it's uncomfortable. Because if I'm talking to Tristan, I don't make her stop and wait um, for my answer. If she doesn't answer, I'm assuming she hasn't heard me. Um, and I'll show you how that can be kind of um, a problem when it comes to people who use AAC. Um, Expecting communication is huge. Um, one of my favorite examples of this, um, I had a student move to a different group home and I trained them on the student and he had a book, communication book, and it was a pretty robust book. And I told staff, I'm like, you, he's going to kind of trick you into thinking he can't do stuff, but he can. And um, they were like, man, after the first day, they're like, he really can't use his book. Like, I think it's too, um, too difficult for him, too much on the pages. And I said, I think you guys are, you know, I think he's trying to trick you a little bit. And um, the next day they called me and they had gone to Chick-fil-A to get dinner and they had ordered him like a Coca-Cola and he ran up to them with his book and flipped to the drink page and pointed to orange pop over and over again, letting them know like, hey, I didn't want a Coca-Cola, I wanted an orange pop. Um, and I just love that example because I think it shows that, um, you know, we have to set that expectation that um, I'm not going to get it for you. I'm not going to do it for you. You need to communicate if you want something. And that's what can make a really successful AAC user. Um, ask for training sessions from the SLP, from the teacher, who's ever working with your child. Um, get help from them. Um, you can even um, take videos. Here's what we're doing and it's not working. Um, vice versa, you can ask for the SLP or teacher to take videos for you in the classroom so you can see what's working for them. Um, but asking for help or training, I think, is really big. Um, allowing those users to be independent, which we'll talk about the prompting hierarchy here in a minute and making the AAC system fun and rewarding. Um, so often when students come to us from all over the country, I'll hear, well, yeah, he had an AAC system, but we only used it during speech or, but we only used it for this academic task. 
And communication should be fun and rewarding. I can ask for um, a drink of pop and I get that drink of pop. And it's um, it's really cool to see when kids start to put that together of, wow, this is such an amazing um, and useful, rewarding tool that I can use to get my wants and needs met. And I think sometimes we forget about that and we turn it into a task. And that's not what you want, because if it communication is just a task, then you're not going to be using it all the time everywhere that you go. Okay, so this slide, um, I have to give credit to Ashley Elliott, who is my supervisor. She came up with this, and I, I love this because it shows you how long that processing time can be and how long you really do need to wait. Um, so this first slide is a typical processing time. Um, so this would be if um, I asked um, Tristan a question, like, what do you want for lunch? And she would say, tacos. Um, and so it's pretty quick processing time. But then on this slide, I'm going to show you when you're working with somebody who uses AAC, I think this is about a 10 second processing time, um, what we can accidentally do sometimes. So if I'm talking to my student and I say, what do you want to drink? This is how long it could take him to answer. And what happens a lot of times is I'm like, oh gosh, he's not answering, he didn't hear me. And so I'm like, oh, hey, oh, I go back, oh boy. Sorry, right, Tristan, I've messed this up. Um, so what can happen is then every time you re-ask that question, you're resetting that bar. And so it would be very easy for me to assume, oh, well, Billy over here can't answer what he wants to drink. But in reality, Billy probably can't answer that. I'm just not allowing him enough processing time. Um, so it's just really important to keep in mind so that you are allowing your um, client or your child to be as independent as possible. Um, and then finally, a very, very important is coming up with a prompting hierarchy. Um, I would say for most of our kids at HeartSpring, we use at least to most. Um, which would include that initial directive, a gesture prompt, a physical, then hand over hand if needed. And that's with those 10 seconds in between each one of those prompts. And the reason we do that is because if you start with hand over hand assistance every time a child after you've waited the 10 seconds doesn't respond to you, um, that's really hard to fade out. And if I'm a child, um, like I was telling you about a minute ago, I'm just always going to let you do hand over hand because that's easier for me. Um, and so that's why we like doing the least to most. Um, there are times when you would use a most to least. Um, one of the more specific examples I can think of is if a student um, has learned the wrong motor pattern. So if I'm working with a child and he's always hitting um, like uh, candy I want instead of I want candy and he's learned that motor pattern, I'm probably going to be doing hand over hand assistance first to help him unlearn um, that motor pattern and learn a new one. Um, you can also see typically there's a verbal prompt in here, um, which a lot of people teach. Um, in our department, we like to leave that out because as you saw with the processing time, um, most people over verbally prompt anyways. <laughs> so we try to teach after that initial directive just to be silent um, with verbal prompting also it's um, it's, it's here and gone. So um, if I verbally prompt to point to the bear versus gesturing to the bear, I, my gesture, my hand is staying there. So the child that I'm working with um, doesn't just hear and it's gone. And so that's why we like to just leave out verbal prompts altogether. Okay. So how now do you incorporate AAC into your everyday life? So the two areas we're really gonna focus on are reading and meal times because like I said, these are two of my favorite times to get a lot of communication opportunities and I'll explain to you in a minute here why. So just a little, little bit about literacy and AAC. So um, as we know, teaching literacy skills to people who use AAC is hard. Um, there's, a, actually lots of studies to show that. 
Um, some of the challenges are um, that everybody who uses AAC is so different. Um, and so it's hard to even get studies on the best interventions. Um, you also, every time you do any of these things, you've got to adapt materials for assessment and interventions. And I'm going to show you how to do some of that. Um, there's also data to show that um, people who use AAC have le less access to printed materials, less access to early writing, and that they're less active participants in reading activities. And I've seen this happen a lot where I'm reading to someone and I'm just sitting there reading and not interacting with them. Um, and for somebody who uses AAC, it could be even less than that because I don't know necessarily how to interact with them while reading a book. So that's why we really wanted to focus kind of on this a little bit today. So um, when we're looking at literacy, I like to look at it through the lens of the big five. So phonological awareness, which um, can be things like rhyming and things like that. Um, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Um, and I put a website down at the bottom, um, aacliteracy.psu.edu, which is fantastic and goes into a lot of detail um, about how to teach AAC specifically to people who use, uh, or how to teach literacy to people who use AAC. So highly, highly recommend if that's something you're interested in checking that out. So um, adapting books, and I'm going to go through this and then we're going to turn the PowerPoint off for a second and I'm gonna show you um, kind of how to do this. Um, so adapting the text is really important. Um, so a lot of times when you're reading a book to somebody, the text is too difficult, um, too many words. So adapting the text by simplifying it and then adding pictures for those main words. So even if I can't read, I can still somewhat follow along with the pictures. And then all you do is print and tape those new pictures and words to the book. Um, we also make sure that we do it not over the actual text. So that way um, we're big fans of working smarter and not harder. <laughs> um, so that way for the kids who can still read it or can still use those, um, that regular uh, wording on the text that they can do that too. Um, so some different ways you can use it. So allow the student to read by identifying the pictures. They can point to the pictures in their AAC system. They can fill in the blank by reading the first part of the sentence, pointing to the last picture. Um, lots of different ways you can do that. So here is a, an example. Um, so you see that um, we put the um, adapted text underneath the regular text. So we could use this with a variety of different students. Um, and then you can see on the second page too, we cut down the worded, uh, the verbiage a lot um, so that it's a little bit easier for the student um, to understand. And you'll see there's a piece of Velcro by the penguin and I'll go over what that is next. So we, in addition, create a vocabulary page. So you remember I said that with an AAC system, whether it's a book or advice, that's really, really important um, and valuable real estate in there. So it might not make sense that I put the word rainbow in my child's 20 page book because it's just not something that um, he talks about a lot. It's not something that's needed right now. But when I'm reading this book, I want to start um, reinforcing that concept of what night is. And so that's why um, we have those little extra pieces of Velcro on there, like the penguin, um, so that you can um, have a vocabulary page so that the student can still participate and still learn some of that vocabulary. Um, also, this is something that I would highly recommend. If you've got a student who's got an AAC system, a high-tech one, it might be totally um, relevant to put these things in their system. But what I've seen happen sometimes is that um, the SLP parent who's ever programming it will just put um, a file that's called, or a folder that's called Draw Me a Star in the system. And then it's got all of this, this wording in it. Here's why I recommend not doing that and putting them into the um, spots that they would typically go is because if our goal at the end of the day is to teach our student what um, rainbow means or what clouds mean, it's not going to help them to ever use it again if they have to go into the draw me a star folder to get to it. So for instance, like clouds, I would probably put under nature or weather. 
And as we're going through the book, I would show them, oh, this is a cloud. Here's how you get to cloud in your device um, because that's where it would naturally be. And my goal would be generalizing um, so that next time we're outside, I can be like, oh, hey, we read that book and talked about what? And we point up to the clouds and the child can then go into the weather or nature and find clouds. Um, so just some examples of how to use it. You can use them for sequencing, to retell, um, asking comprehension questions, just asking questions in general, lots and lots of different ways you can do this. And like I said, we um, typically when we do things like this, we will use one adapted book and use it for all of the functioning levels of kids that we have. And that's why I like um, versatile materials like this, because I can make one book and one vocabulary page, but I can use it in so many different ways to help target the different things that I'm working with with my kids. Okay, so let's see how this would work. All right. Let me get, all right, I'm going to stop. Oh, I need to just, I need to stop sharing, right? Okay, so I've got for you guys, um, this is a, a wonderful, wonderful book. It's called From Head to Toe by Eric Carl. Um, so you'll see that we've adapted the verbiage. And then we've also got, like I said, that little um, piece of Velcro. Um, so if I'm working with somebody with AAC, and we've also got, this is the vocabulary page that goes along with it. We normally just Velcro it in the front of the book. So if I'm working with somebody who um, is using AAC, first and foremost, I obviously want to make sure they've got their device with them so that they can actually participate. Um, but I might say, um, I turn my head, can you? And then what I might ask my child to do, um, I like to incorporate gross motor as much as possible. So we might practice turning our heads together. And then I might on their device, ask them. Oops. So this is what's called the touch chat application. Oops, there we go. So I might ask them, um, hey, what animal did you see Joey in that picture? And instead of using the um, vocabulary page, because Joey's got all of this in his system, I would help him, if he doesn't do it independently, um, I would help him again, starting with that gesture prompt if needed, but go to groups, animals, and let's see, where was rabbit? Uh, wild, or not rabbit. And then I might help him go to whatever the picture is. Um, I think he was in, Water animals, there we go. And this is why you take time to look through um, your child's device to know where these things are before you start. Um, and then I would hit penguin or I would have the child hit penguin. So that's how you can use it if you're using a system. Um, or if I've got a child who's got a communication book that doesn't have a lot, I can provide them with this um, to help them. Um, what I love about having these pull off pictures too is maybe these. this is way too many for my student to scan. So maybe I'll just take off two of them and I'll say, okay, Joey, um, what animal did we see on that page? And there's a picture of a penguin and a picture of a head. So he'd also have to know that these were animals. Um, so I could pull off two animals if I needed, but then he can just point or grab, um, put it on the page. Um, again, lots and lots of different ways that you can do this. Um, and we've also got a handout um, that we can get, I guess probably you, Tristan, um, about how to adapt books that we put together for the Kansas Literacy Festival. Um, that just kind of has all of that on there that we talked about, which is helpful, hopefully. So, um, okay, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen now. All right, do you see that on there, Tristan? Okay. Right. So these are just um, some ideas of what um, goals might look like or things that you're identifying um, within that area. So it might be um, identifying the amount of syllables in a target vocabulary. Um, you know, it can go all the way to comprehension using that vocabulary to sequence um, what happened in the book. Um, so there's lots and lots of different um, ways. And I'm happy if um, anyone who's watching has questions or wants to talk more about that area in particular, I've done quite a bit with it. So we can help come up with ideas if you're an SLP and you need to come up with goals or something like that. 
Um, so the last part is mealtime. Mealtime is probably my absolute favorite time to work with kids because who's not motivated by food, right? Um, and so some different ways to think about this. So um, allowing choices. Um, a lot of people who use AAC um, or just people with special needs in general don't get many options throughout their day. So allowing the option to choose is so big for our clients. And so maybe um, they're having uh, chocolate milk and regular milk. So I might even just hold out, do you want the chocolate milk or do you want the um the regular milk and let them point because if they're pointing, um, that's communication, that's unaided AAC, they're making those choices for themselves um, and becoming more autonomous in their life, which is important for us to remember. Um, also, so we could, um, and when I was in school, we called this sabotaging the situation. Um, so being so, like really purposeful when you're setting up mealtime so that you're creating an environment where communication is needed. So that can include things like, um, I have a student who loves barbecue sauce, um, but I don't give her barbecue sauce, even though I know she wants it because I want her to use her device to tell us because there's going to be a day when she's not with me and I don't want her to be dependent on me to get her wants and needs met. That kind of goes back to that idea we talked about with learned helplessness. Um, or it could be something like spoon, like leave a spoon out and help them communicate, I need a spoon. Um, and like I said, just don't automatically help, I think is the main thing here. So if they're having trouble opening their milk, that's when I see a lot. And I honestly have trouble opening it sometimes too. Um, but if they're having trouble opening that milk, don't just automatically go do it for them. Ask them, you know, do you need help? And they can answer yes, no, or say like, hey, it looks like you need something. Let me help you to find help in your system. Again, using that prompting hierarchy. Um, especially for vocabulary like help and more, it's really... It it's a hard um, concept because like I said, it can't be easily um, represented by a picture or an item. So I can teach somebody what a cup means pretty quickly um, because they can see the cup, they can see the picture and they can pair those two together, but help and more are different. Um, and so when we are, when I'm doing mealtime with the students, a lot of times, um, I, I have a student who um, likes to hide his book in his closet. And um, I was at dinner with him one night and um, I just told him, I'm like, if you want something, you need to go get your book and tell me, I'm not going to automatically um, do that for you. And I think we, um, we waited each other out with a staring contest for about 30 minutes before he did finally go get his book and tell me that he wanted more roles. And then I provided that for him, which is another important part is that if um, you need to provide a reaction to that communication immediately so that the student understands that. Um, use those choice boards. So you can see up in the corner, um, one of our OTs, Kay, does an adventurous eating group with some of our students. Um, and so those were some of the items. So again, giving them that choice. Those might not be things that we would want in a communication system or a book, um, especially if the kids don't like it, um, but providing that communication board so that they've still got a way to communicate. Um, and then my favorite is the use of expectant pauses. So this is actually a term in the literature and it's basically um, pausing for an extended period of time. So um, saying something like, oh, it looks like you need and waiting for them to actually complete the sentence for you, um, which can be really beneficial. Okay, so that kind of sums everything up. I hope I covered everything, Tristan. Um, like I said, my email's on there. I have people reach out quite often and I love to help, whether you're a parent, an SLP, a teacher, whoever. Um, I'm happy, happy to help and give tips and tricks. Um, like I said, this is a passion of mine. So giving a voice to the voiceless is something I care a lot about and I'm happy to help in whatever capacity I can. Perfect. Thank you so much, Holly. I know that was super informative for me and we hope that was informative um, for you who are listening. And like Holly said, you can reach out to her directly. Um, Holly, if someone reaches out to you and you need materials or someone needs materials, you can contact care at um, C-A-R-E at heartspring.org and we can make that and work together um, and get everything that you need to you um, to support you and your family. So thank you so much, Holly, and thank you all for listening. I hope you have a great day.